Tak, a zde pro kšelf. The Fir Tree by Hans Christian Andersen Far away in the deep forest, there once grew a pretty fir tree. The situation was delightful. The sun shone full upon him, the breeze played freely around him, and in the neighbourhood grew many companion fir trees, some older, some younger. But the little fir tree was not happy. He was always longing to be tall. He thought not of the warm sun and the fresh air. He cared not for the merry, prattling peasant children who came to the forest to look for strawberries and raspberries. Except indeed sometimes, when after having filled their pitchers, or threaded the bright berries on a straw, they would sit down near the little fir tree and say, What a pretty little tree this is! And then the fir tree would feel very much vexed. Year by year he grew. A long green shoot sent he forth every year. You may always tell how many years a fir tree has lived by counting the number of joints in its stem. Oh, that I was as tall as the others are, sighed the little tree. Then I should spread up my branches so far, and my crown should look out over the wide world around. The birds would build their nests among my branches, and when the wind blew, I should bend my head so grandly, just as the others do. He had not pleasure in the sunshine, in the song of the birds, or in the birds or in the red clouds that sailed over him every morning and evening. In the winter time, when the ground was covered with the white, glistening snow, there was a hare that would come continually scampering about and jumping right over the little tree's head. And that was most provoking. However, two winters passed away, and by the third, the tree was so tall that the hare was obliged to run around it. Oh, to grow, to grow, to become tall and old. That is the only thing in the world worth living for. So thought the tree. The woodcutters came in the autumn and felled some among the largest of the trees. This happened every year, and the young fir, who was by this time a tolerable height, shuddered when he saw those grand, magnificent trees fall with a tremendous crash, crackling to the earth. Their boughs were then all cut off. Terribly naked and lanky and long did the stem look after this. They could hardly be recognised. They were laid one upon another in wagons, and horses drew them away, far, far away from the forest. <coughs> Where could they be going? What might be their fortunes? So next spring, when the swallows and the storks had returned from abroad, the tree asked them, saying, Know you not whither they are taken? Have you not met them? The swallows knew nothing about the matter, but the stork looked thoughtful for a moment, then nodded his head and said, Yes, I believe I have seen them. As it was flying from Egypt to this place, I met several ships. Those ships had splendid masts. I have little doubt that they were the trees that you speak of. They smelled like fir wood. I may congratulate you, for they sailed gloriously, quite gloriously. Oh, that I too were tall enough to sail upon the sea. Tell me what it is, this sea. And what it looks like. Thank you, it would take too long, a great deal, said the stork, and away he stalked. Rejoice in thy youth, said the sunbeams. Rejoice in thy luxuriant youth, in the fresh life that is within thee. And the wind kissed the tree, and the dew wept tears over him.
for the fir tree understood them not. When Christmas approached, many quite young trees were felled. Trees which were, some of them, not so tall, or of just the same height as the young restless fir tree, who was always longing to be away. These young trees were chosen from the most beautiful. Their branches were not cut off. They were laid in a wagon, and horses drew them away, far, far away from the forest. Where can they be going? asked the fir tree. They are not larger than I am. Indeed, one of them was much less. Why do they keep all their branches? Where can they be gone? We know, we know, twittered the sparrows. We peeped into the windows of the town below, and know where they are gone. Oh, you cannot think what honour and glory they receive. We looked through the window panes, and saw them planted in a warm room, and decked out with such beautiful things. Gilded apples, sweetmates, playthings, and hundreds of bright candles. And then, asked the fir tree, trembling in every bough, and then? What happened then? Oh, we saw no more. That was beautiful. Beautiful beyond compare. Is this glorious lot destined to be mine? Cried the fir tree with delight. This is far better than sailing over the sea. How I long for the time. Oh, that I were even now in the wagon. That I were in the warm room, honoured and adored. And then, yes, then something still better must happen. Else why should they take the trouble to decorate me? It must be that something still greater, still more splendid must happen. But what? Oh, I suffer. I suffer with longing. I know not what it is that I feel. Rejoice in our love, said the air and the sunshine. Rejoice in my youth and my freedom. But rejoice he never would. He grew and grew. In winter, as in summer, he stood there clothed in green, dark green foliage. The people that saw him said, That is a beautiful tree. And next Christmas, he was the first that was felled. The axe struck sharply through the wood. The tree fell to the earth with a heavy groan. He suffered an agony, a faintness that he had never expected. He quite forgot to think of his good fortune. He felt such sorrow at being compelled to leave his home, the place whence he had sprung. He knew that he should never see again those dear old comrades, or the little bushes and flowers that had flourished under his shadow, perhaps not even the birds. Neither did he find the journey by any means pleasant. The tree first came to himself, when in the courtyard to which he first was taken with the other trees, he heard a man say, This is a splendid one, the very thing we want. Then came two smartly dressed servants, and carried the fir tree into a large and handsome saloon. Pictures hung on the walls, and on the mantelpiece stood large Chinese vases with lions on the lids. There were rocking chairs, silken sofas, tables covered with picture books, and toys that had cost a hundred times a hundred rick sailors, at least so said the children, and the fir tree was planted in a large cask filled with sand. But no one could know that it was a cask, for it was hung with green cloth, and placed upon the carpet woven of many gay colours. Oh, how the tree trembled! What was to happen next? A young lady, assisted by the servants, now began to adorn him. Upon some branches they hung little nets, cut out of coloured paper, every net filled with sugar plums. From others, gilded apples and walnuts were suspended, looking just as if they had grown there. And more than a hundred little wax tapers, red, blue and white, were placed here and there among the boughs. Dolls that looked almost like men and women, the tree had never seen such things before, seemed dancing to and fro among the leaves, and highest, on the summit, was fastened a large star of gold tinsel. This was indeed splendid, splendid beyond compare. This evening, they said, this evening it will be lighted up. Would that it were evening, thought the tree. Would that the lights were kindled, for then, what will happen then? 
Will the trees come out of the forest to see me? Will the sparrows fly here and look in through the window panes? Shall I stand here adorned both winter and summer? He thought much of it. He thought till he had bark ache from longing. And bark aches with trees are as bad as headaches with us. The candles were lighted. Oh, what a blaze of splendour! The tree trembled in all his branches, so that one of them caught fire. Oh dear! cried the young lady, and it was extinguished in great haste. So the tree dared not tremble again. He was so fearful of losing something of his splendour. He felt almost bewildered in the midst of all this glory and brightness. And now, all of a sudden, both folding doors were flung open and a troop of children rushed in as if they had a mind to jump over him. The older people followed more quietly. The little ones stood quite silent, but only for a moment. Then their jubilee burst forth afresh. They shouted till the walls re-echoed. They danced round the tree. One present after another was torn down. What are they doing? thought the tree. What will happen now? And the candles burned down to the branches so they were extinguished, and the children were given leave to plunder the tree. Oh, they rushed upon him in such riot that the boughs all crackled. Had not his son had been festooned with a gold star to the ceiling, he would have been overturned. The children danced and played about with their beautiful playthings. No one thought any more of the tree except the old nurse, who came and peeped among the boughs, but it was only to see whether perchance a fig or an apple had been left among them. A story! A story! cried the children, pulling a short, thick man toward the tree. He sat down, saying, It is pleasant to sit under the shade of green boughs. Besides, the tree may be better fitted by here, my story, but I shall only tell you one. Would you like to hear about Ivody Avody, or about Humpty Dumpty, who fell downstairs and yet came to the throne and won the princess? Ivody Avody, cried some. Humpty Dumpty, cried others. There was a famous uproar. The fir tree alone was silent, thinking to himself, ought I to make a noise as they do, or ought I to do nothing at all? for he most certainly was one of the company, and had done all that had been required of him. And the short, thick man told the story of Humpty Dumpty, who fell downstairs, and yet came to the throne and won the princess. And the children clapped their hands, and called out for another. They wanted to hear the story of Ivor the Avody also, but they did not get it. The fir tree stood meanwhile, quite silent and thoughtful. The birds in the forest had never related anything like this. Humpty Dumpty fell downstairs and yet was raised to the throne and won the princess. Yes, yes, strange things come to pass in the world, thought the fir tree, who believed it must all be true, because such a pleasant man had related it. Ah, ah, who knows that I may fall downstairs and win a princess? And he rejoiced in the expectation of being next day again decked out with candles and playthings, gold and fruit. Tomorrow I will not tremble, thought he. I will rejoice in my magnificence. Tomorrow I shall again hear the story of Humpty Dumpty, and perhaps that about Ivory Avery likewise. And the tree mused thereupon all night. In the morning, the maids came in. Now begins my state anew, thought the tree. But they dragged him out of the room. Up the stairs and into an attic chamber, and there thrust him into a dark corner where not a ray of light could penetrate. What can be the meaning of this? thought the tree. What am I to do here? What shall I hear in this place? And he leant against the wall and thought and thought, and plenty of time he had for thinking it over. For day after day, and night after night passed away, and yet no one ever came into the room. At last, somebody did come in, but it was only to push into the corner some old trunks.
The tree was now entirely hidden from sight, and apparently entirely forgotten. It is now winter, thought the tree. The ground is hard and covered with snow. They cannot plant me now, so I am to stay here in shelter till the spring. Men are so clever and prudent. I only wish it were not so dark and dreadfully lonely. Not even a little hare. Oh, how pleasant it was in the forest, when the snow lay on the ground and the hare scampered about. Yes, even when he jumped over my head, though I did not like it then. It is so terribly lonely here. Squeak! Squeak! cried a little mouse, just then gliding forward. Another followed. They snuffed about the fir tree. And then slipped in and out among the branches. It is horribly cold, said the little mice. Otherwise it is very comfortable here. Don't you think so, you old fir tree? I am not old, said the fir tree. There are many who are much older than I am. How came you here? asked the mice. And what do you know? They were most uncommonly curious. Tell us about the most delightful place on earth. Have you ever been there? Have you been into the storeroom, where cheeses lie on the shelves, and bacon hangs from the ceiling, where one can dance over tallow candles, where one goes in thin and comes out fat? I know nothing about that, said the tree. But I know the forest, where the sun shines and where the birds sing. And then he spoke of his youth and its pleasures. The little mice had never heard anything like it before. They listened so attentively and said, Well, to be sure, how much you have seen, how happy you have been. Happy, repeated the fir tree in surprise, and he thought a moment over all that he had been saying. Yes, on the whole, those were pleasant times. He then told them about the Christmas Eve, when he had been decked out with cakes and candles. Oh, cried the little mice, how happy you have been, you old fir tree. I am not old at all, returned the fir. It is only this winter that I have left the forest. I am just in the prime of life. How well you can talk, said the little mice. And the next night they came again and brought with them four other little mice, who wanted also to hear the tree's history. And the more the tree spoke of his youth in the forest, the more vividly he remembered it, and said, Yes, those were pleasant times, but they may come again. They may come again. Humpty Dumpty fell downstairs, and for all that he won the princess. Perhaps I too may win the princess. And then the fir tree thought of a pretty little delicate birch tree that grew in the forest. A real princess. A very lovely princess was she to the fir tree. Who is this Humpty Dumpty? asked the little mice. Whereupon he related the tale. He could remember every word of it perfectly. And the little mice were ready to jump to the top of the tree for joy. The night following, several more mice came. And on Sunday came also two rats. They, however, declared that the story was not at all amusing, which much vexed the little mice, who, after hearing their opinion, could not like it so well either. Do you know only that one story? asked the rats. Only that one, answered the tree. I heard it on the happiest evening of my life, though I did not then know how happy I was. It is a miserable story. Do you know none about pork and tallow? No storeroom story? No, said the tree. Well then, we have heard enough of it, returned the rats, and they went their ways. The little mice too never came again. The tree sighed. It was pleasant when they sat round me, those busy little mice, listening to my words. Now that too is all past. However, I shall have pleasure in remembering it when I am taken away from this place. But when would that be? One morning, people came and rooted out the lumber room. The trunks were taken away. The tree, too, was dragged out of the corner. They threw him carelessly on the floor. But one of the servants picked him up and carried him downstairs. Once more, he beheld the light of day. Now, life begins again, thought the tree. He felt the fresh air, the warm sunbeams. He was out in the court. 
All happened so quickly that the tree quite forgotten to look at himself. There was so much to look at all around. The court joined the garden. Everything was so fresh and blooming. The roses clustered so bright and so fragrant round the trellis work. The lime trees were in full blossom, and the swallows flew backwards and forwards, twittering, Query very heat, my beloved is come. But it was not the fir tree whom they meant. I shall live! I shall live! He was filled with delighted hope. He tried to spread out his branches. But alas, they were all dried up and yellow. He was thrown down upon a heap of weeds and nettles. The star of gold tinsel that had been left fixed on his crown now sparkled brightly in the sunshine. Some merry children were playing in the court. The same who at Christmas time had danced round the tree. One of the youngest now perceived the gold star and ran to tear it off. Look at it! Still fastened to the ugly old Christmas tree! cried he, trampling upon the boughs till they broke under his boots. And the tree looked on all the flowers of the garden, now blooming in the freshness of their beauty. He looked upon himself and he wished from his heart that he had been left to wither alone in the dark corner of the lumber room. He called to mind his happy forest life, the merry Christmas Eve, and the little mice who had listened so eagerly when he related the story of Humpty Dumpty. Past, all past, said the poor tree, had I but been happy as I might have been. Past, all past. And the servants came and broke the tree into small pieces, heaped them up and set fire to them. And the tree groaned deeply and every groan sounded like a little shot. The children all ran up to the place and jumped about in front of the blaze, looking into it and crying, Piff! But at each of those heavy groans, the fir tree thought of a bright summer's day, or a starry winter's night in the forest, of Christmas Eve, or of Humpty Dumpty, the only story that he knew and could relate. And at last, the tree was burned. The boys played about the court. On the bosom of the youngest sparkled the gold star that the tree had worn on the happiest evening of his life. But that was past, and the tree was past. And the story also passed, passed, for all stories must come to an end, sometime or other.